Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I want to start off by a show of hands. Who here has actually heard of the Northern Mariana Islands? All right, almost everyone. Who actually knows where it's at? Uh, I was actually quite surprised. Well, I didn't, and uh, I didn't know until I actually moved there about three and a half years ago. So just to kind of give everyone an idea where we're at, uh, essentially, if you, well, you, CNMI is a US protectorate. It's uh, located about 15 degrees north latitude uh, in the Pacific. And if you drew a line roughly from south from Japan and east from the Philippines, right where they intersect would be where the Marianas Trench is, and that's where you'd find the Mariana Islands. So the island chain consists of about 14 islands. Um, some count 15, uh, depends on uh, who you talk to. But basically, what we have here is 14 islands, and as you go down south, Saipan is the capital. And this is the largest island and the most developed. Uh, this is where I live. Uh, most of the population lives here. There's about 50,000 people throughout the islands. Um, going south of that is Tinian and Rota, and this is where the other populations of humans tend to occur. Anything north of that is roughly uninhabited. Um, there's a few families and a couple people that live on some of these islands, but uh, despite humans, it actually hosts a whole slew of animals and plant species that are endemic and endangered and not located anywhere else in the entire world. So that's where I come in. I work for the local division of Fish and Wildlife. Um, we're largely funded by United States Fish and Wildlife through their WISFER program, which is the Wildlife and Sports uh, Fish Recreation Program, which gets funding from the Pittman-Robertson Act. So believe it or not, uh, as Americans, we, everyone thinks we have, everyone has guns and ammos. There's actually a conservation tax on every firearm and every bullet that's sold. And that goes to do two things, uh, provide game management for hunting and other sports, uh, sporting type things, as well as conservation of uh, endangered species. In Saipan, we mostly don't have any game species that we manage, so all our funding actually goes to uh, conserving endangered species. So we do this through a variety of methods, and one is actually provide technical guidance for land use activities and permits. So if you want to develop your land, you apply for a land permit, you come in, um, goes through multiple agencies, one, make sure there's not going to be soil erosion problems, et cetera, it gets to our agency. We actually survey for endangered species, and we give a uh, yes or no based on whether or not there's a presence of one on your property. We also do more interesting uh, surveys where we actually, at least once a year, go up to those northern islands. We camp out there, we live there for two or three weeks. We go by helicopter boat, do these massive biological surveys. Um, it's pretty amazing, it's like National Geographic style, it's awesome. Um, and we collect that data and we, we re revisit these areas once every roughly 10 years. Then we have a whole bunch of other projects going on, like uh, using radio telemetry, where we tag some of these endangered species, follow them with transmitters, calculate home ranges, geotag bats, uh, especially the Marianas fruit bat, have a data logger that collects information. It logs like every, I forget, maybe like every 20 minutes so we can see like spatial represent, re representation of habitat use and things like home ranges. But I'm actually not going to talk about any of those cool projects, and we're actually going to go back to this whole technical guidance uh, permitting activity, but we will talk about these things in a little bit. It all tie together. So when I first arrived in Saipan three and a half years ago, this was essentially the permitting database. It's all paper copies, um, very little, maybe in an Excel file or something along those lines. But it's actually a really important data set because once, I, like I said before, if you go out and you want to clear your land, you apply for a permit. Our texts in the past used to go out with a paper copy, uh, actually survey for the bird species, write it down on multiple dates, and also draw these like hand, handmade maps, and that would actually be the spatial footprint of your permitting activity. So it had evolved at some point where we were collecting GPS points using like those little handheld Garmin's. Sometimes you'll just have the point uh, for you know, the, the waypoint actually located here. Other times you would actually have the coordinates. Uh, but this is no good. This is all sitting in these, uh, you know, essentially these file cabinets. 
there's a whole bunch of important data that we could be using um, that's just sitting there. And one thing I want to kind of reiterate is that there, there could be multiple surveys for one spatial footprint. So that they come back multiple days and do surveys depending uh, whether or not they find a rare species and, and things along those lines. So I saw as a major priority was we need to establish some sort of centralized database, get all this data loaded up, um, and that's what we did. So we took 15 years worth of data. Um, I think it was like 2,700 permits. Uh, and Joe and I, this is my GIS technician, started entering it all in um, and actually digitizing the spatial footprint. So what we actually used was uh, Google Drive. So we just set up a Google Sheet. Super easy tech, easy to do. Nice thing, it's cloud-based. In the Marianas, we have tons of typhoons. There's a lot of typhoon damage. We don't have to worry about uh, the database getting destroyed in some sort of catastrophe. Another beautiful thing about this is actually we can have multiple users at it at the same time. So as I'm entering historic records, Joe can be on the same Google uh, sheet entering in records. As new permits are also coming in, we can have another tech all editing at the same time. And it's version, so we can always look at the history of edits. If someone makes a mistake, completely erases the database, no big deal. We just reset back to an earlier version. And another nice thing about this is I'm able to go in through Python and actually pull this out into a pandas data frame and like save it as a CSV file and then use it, use it later for uh, you know, further analysis and manipulation. So Joe is also going in. He's drawing the historic polygons, sometimes from those maps, sometimes using the waypoint information. Um, but the idea here is all we're going to do is just have a single field with the permit ID that's going to link it back to the database with the permitting surveys. Make sense so far? All good, perfect. So that took about a year, um, but all the data is in there. And moving forward, we never want to do that again. So we're going to automate the data collection and essentially the management. And since we're usually out in the jungles, we want like a really rugged GPS-enabled tablet. So we're using Juniper Mesa 2s. We have about five of these. Um, and there's two applications that we run for data collection. For the spatial mapping, we actually use Intermaps Roam, which is based off of uh, QGIS. It's a data collection app. But enable to cl collect the tabular data, since there could be multiple surveys, you know, many relationships to one in terms of the spatial footprint, we design these PyQT uh, kind of interfaces. And we'll look at that a little bit more. And the reason there is because we have a really complex uh, like survey system that it's just not going to work with most likely Q field or survey one, two, three or anything along those lines. The nice thing is once the, the field tech goes out, they can come back. It'll all sync vert, uh, via Wi-Fi to our network. Um, and then we have these Python scripts that run and essentially update the tabular and spatial databases back on the Google Drive. And then Kind of one thing that came out of this was all of a sudden the director really wanted maps reduced for every one of these. Uh, we automated that process too. So we just looped through each permitting uh, feature in the permit areas, zoomed to it, query out all the other uh, polygons, do a small little calculation that adjusts the scale, and then uh, automatically print out the map. And originally this was done in using ArcPy, but I've now almost navigated to using PyQGIS, which I think everyone should be happy about. Um, <laughs> So it's actually not that uh, complicated, but this script just runs every night, automatically produces maps. No one has to worry about making maps. So it's easy to say, but, uh, but I think it's best displayed through this series of amateur home videos that I've stitched together and edited probably with some sort of free software as well, I'm sure. But anyways, so I'm going to take it away. Let's hope it works. So this is Marlon. Marlon receives land use permit. Um, so she gets it. She starts entering the information into the, the Google Sheet, such as the owner of the property, the land use type uh, activity, and things along those lines. Kika is our other field technician. She goes out in the field. First thing she's going to do is start actually mapping out the, the footprint so she can do it manually or she can walk around and take GPS points. But that's the Intermats Roam software. And I actually want to pause it if I can. 
At this point, what's actually not displayed is there is a little field form that pops up and just asks for the permit ID. So the unique identifier, it's not displayed here. But I think that's really important to tie it into what I'm later gonna talk about. So then Kika opens up this PyQT app that I built and it's dynamically linked to what was entered in on that permitting uh, spreadsheet. So these are all the active permits that she's choosing from. She selects a permit, it loads up the information. She can make sure that she's at the right site with the right landowner. There's another tab to collect site information. And this last tab is actually the species survey. So Kika's gonna go select her name, which is Francis. Kika's her nickname. Start the survey, it shows the time. She's listening for birds. She's starting to hit the spin boxes and she's making counts for different species. So right now she's got two Micronesian starlings, two bridal white eyes, and a bit turn. After X number of minutes, she ends her survey. Um, that allows her to save the results. And this actually gets saved as a single line uh, SS, S, ah, CSV file that later comes back, syncs up to our network, script runs, uploads it to the Google Drive. Um, and now her survey is actually back onto that centralized database. So at night, scripts run again, and it actually shuttles all this information using that permit ID into its own directory. So if the directory is there, it throws the data in there. If it's uh, not, it actually creates it. And we're able to pass it through Python, through HTML, and then make these PDFs uh, that actually should display the survey results that can be later used for reporting. So there's a uh, survey, three surveys. Like I said before, we also automatically produce these maps every night as well. And the first time that ran, it ran for days because it produced like 3,000 maps or something, but they're all there. They were also able to do some kind of neat and nifty things using Python as well, which is produce these monthly reports. And we could actually grab the spatial information from that as well if we tie, link it back with the polygons and get like maybe the amount of land that was permitted that month and throughout the year and things along those lines. And finally, with all these scripts running that are producing these outputs, I actually have them email me and let me know every night whether they, they succeeded or failed. So there's a good example of a permitting download that failed, but the other scripts kind of ran and things along those lines. So to reiterate the whole process, all the tech does now is enter in the data onto the Google Drive, go out, map the boundary, do their survey, comes back. These usually actually sync up and automate at night. So the next day they have all this output available for them. It makes everyone's lives way easier. And our GIS tech doesn't have to make a map every time they go out, like someone goes out to do a survey. So up to date, uh, I launched this in January 2018, and there's 685 permits that have been entered using this system. And by taking the centroids of those polygons, we can actually map the detection spatially as point counts. And it ends up we, we've entered 6,300 new species detections recorded. So what that means is it's a species count per day, per sample effort. So per species account is one point per date. So the benefits of this, obviously it's more efficient uh, data entry and collection. There's less errors in transferring or entering data. And the future steps is to help kind of automate this process for our other types of surveys. So we'll actually have these like Python built uh, field survey things with some sort of spatial linked, linked up. But the, so build similar apps or other surveys. But you know this is fine, this is great, but I don't think this is like too impressive. Um, people do this all the time, every day, right? The big picture is by taking all this data from all these different surveys and having that spatial component with the species detections, we can actually pull it all together into this master species database. So we run a Python script that does this. So all the other surveys I didn't talk about, that's all the data coming in too, and it ends up we have almost a quarter million records over 37 years. And this is data that's just, which was either sitting on someone's computer, sitting on a paper copy just stored somewhere. And this is a really amazing, robust data set that helps fulfill our mission needs. So it lets us understand and man provide better management of the species in the CNMI. We can do this through looking at species detections uh, over time and build things like species distribution models this is using R. 
and basically associate habitat associations, plan for uh, basically better population management. So I think I'm running out of time, but uh, just kind of a recap. Uh, basically, there's a whole bunch of free and open source solutions out there that actually can help streamline this whole process. And in the end, it uh, benefits us and it benefits the species that we're trying to protect. And with that, uh, thank you, and I'll open up the floor for questions. Thank you, Bradley. Uh, five minutes for questions. Anyone? Uh, first. Uh, when was the last survey that you did of the whole island that you said you do on a 10-year basis? So we did a survey last year on Saipan. This year we'll be, uh, well, in the upcoming months we'll be going to Anatan, which is a volcanic island just above us. Um, probably spend two weeks there um, collecting vegetation information, invert, uh, bird surveys and things along those lines. So we're supposed to go every year to a one of the islands, if we can. Uh, sort of a simplistic question. What about the, when you're doing permit work? Uh, is there a, is, is there a cadastral survey so that, like, presumably people know what land they are? Uh, very. <laughs> yeah, that's a long story. Um, yeah, there's another agency that manages that, and they've been a little bit uh, slow on updating it. So. There's been issues before where the lot information doesn't quite match up or there's miscommunication or, or something along those lines. So that can be a problem. Um, but in general, there are boundaries marked at every, every lot. So, so you recreate? Yeah, well, actually we require that the people have their property already, uh, the boundaries already delineated. So they hire a surve surveyor outside of us because our services are free. Um, to actually mark the boundaries and then our technician goes out. If the boundaries aren't marked, our technician's not gonna machete through the jungle trying to track down where this person's lot is, so, yeah. So there are boundaries. Uh, nice, thanks. Um, how, how did you go in terms of managing the change? Like, like was there a big challenge in training the technicians and the users and, or even selling it to the organization as well? Yeah, so. <laughs> This was kind of in tears, so I, I had this vision. I wish I showed my uh, outline on my whiteboard, which is just chaos. Um, so, you know, first was actually setting up the database in the Google Drive. Getting the field tablets took quite a while. Um, it's government time, and it's government, uh, or island time on the government, you know. Uh, so there's a couple stages where I just had them uploading GPX points and actually manipulating it that way. Um, so, it being so simple to use Intramaps Roam, uh, especially when you're just drawing a boundary and filling in one field, that was quite easy for people to get used to. Uh, the database, not that big of an issue. Uh, all our technicians are actually younger, so I feel like they're more exposed to <laughs> these types of uh, computer programs and things along those lines. And the field survey, um, you know, everyone loved that little Python app because it's the same as the field form. It's just you know, way quicker and less writing and, and things along those lines. I should add, like the beauty of having it back, upload back to the cloud or at least onto the Google Drive, is that if there is an error, that's like where it permanently resides. They can correct like a data entry error there, and it's actually going to flow back down into the reports and things along those lines. Anyone else? That was great, thanks. Um, is your code open source and where can I get the code? <laughs> <laughs> it's on Bitbucket, uh, but it's not, well, I'm more than happy to share it to, with you, uh, but it's not quite like an open program necessarily, but yeah. So do you do any special surveys when a typhoon comes around? So, Uh, not always. Um, there's multiple surveys that are going on. There's a breeding bird survey that the data is collected every quarter. 
Um, so the last typhoon that really hit us bad was U2. I don't know if anyone heard about that. We are without power and water for about a month. Um, we actually resurveyed immediately after U2. Uh, so some surveys we are actually you know, trying to see if we can get information about pre and post typhoon effects. And one project that I'm going to be working on within the next year is actually taking um, hopefully some multiple band, uh, multiple spectra satellite imagery and looking at vegetation resiliency following typhoon events at multiple resolutions. And we're looking at uh, typhoon, a major typhoon event in 2015, another island got hit in 2016, we just got hit in 2018, so uh, I think we'll have some pretty good idea about how the vegetation in the seas might rebound and things along those lines. But yeah, that's certainly something of interest to us. Uh, that's it. That's it. Yeah, All right, thanks, great. Man, thank you very much. You get that. Thank you. Very oh, much. thank you. <laughs> thank you